All right, we're on the air. Well, welcome everyone to another week of Ed Startup 101. I'm glad to have you all with us for today's conversation with Fred Wilson. I um, want to make sure that everyone remembers that it, as you have uh, follow-up questions that you'd like to ask, to put those in uh, put those in Twitter with the hashtag Ed Startup. We'll catch those and feed them to Fred as we uh, move through the conversation. So. Fred, thanks for joining us. I, could, would you start by just telling us a little bit about yourself, where you came from, how you ended up in the position you're in now? Uh, happy to do that, uh, and uh, thanks for having me uh, participate in this. Uh, this is uh, an online learning uh, environment, right? That's what that's what's going on here. Uh, well, that's fantastic, and uh, uh, obviously a big fan of uh, what people can and are doing in the online learning space, so uh, uh, it's a pleasure to, to be uh, involved in this. I'm a venture capitalist. I've been uh, doing venture capital as a career for now 25 years. I've worked in three venture capital firms. The first uh, venture capital firm that I went to work for, I joined when I was 25 years old. I went to MIT undergrad and, and got a master's degree in business from the University of Pennsylvania and at age 25 knowing literally nothing about business I joined a venture capital firm and I spent 10 years in a very much an apprenticeship type role to a couple of uh, pretty experienced venture capitalists um, who were in their mid late 50s they were older at that time than I am today so uh, I learned a lot from them, and then at age 35, um, I left and started a venture capital firm called Flatiron Partners. And the idea uh, for Flatiron Partners was to invest in internet companies. The internet, the commercial internet, had arrived a year or two uh, previously, and uh, I thought, uh, as well as a number of other people, thought that the internet was going to be a one of these big macro investment themes and so we started a venture capital firm without much uh, in the way of uh, thinking beyond that you know this was going to be big and we should invest in it and uh, and we had uh, quite a good run with that uh, venture capital firm we um, invested about 500 million dollars in about five years between 1996 and 2001 and uh, made a lot of money, lost a lot of money, backed a bunch of stupid ideas, backed a lot of smart ideas and um, and in the process learned a lot about what uh, what actually worked, what business models worked on the internet and what business models didn't. Uh, we ended up winding down that firm for a bunch of reasons um, and uh, I still manage it but it, it's uh, been dormant for a now. And then uh, a couple of years later in 2003, uh, along with a, my partner Brad Burnham, we started Union Square Ventures. And uh, I guess the, the simple way to put it is that we had both been very active investors in what I guess we could call Web 1.0, uh, the sort of crazy five year period leading up to the bubble and the crash. And we both learned a lot about um, internet business models and uh, what um, what made sense and what didn't make sense. And so we codified that in an investment thesis for Unisquare Ventures and uh, have now made 50 investments uh, to date in uh, nine years. Uh, and we now have uh, two other early stage partners here. Andy and Albert and uh, an administrative partner, John Buttrick, who also helps us make some more later stage investments. And uh, uh, we um, uh, are, you know, active uh, and engaged investors in uh, a number of, um, we think, interesting internet companies, including some in the online education space. Um, so that that's who I am. and. Uh, uh, you know, I can get into more detail if people want to, but I think that's a, you know, hopefully a, a short and sweet introduction. Yeah, that's great, and and it leads in really well to some of the questions that the you know the students in this uh, ed tech entrepreneurship class submitted questions during the week, which got voted up and down, and that that 
that the introduction leads in really well to, to one of the questions that was asked. So the, one, of, one of the first questions you know, has to do with uh, companies like Code Academy and Edmodo and Duolingo and Coursera and, um, and, and you have invested in some companies like this and the, the question was it seems like uh, for these startups that at least initially the, the business model is raising capital and so the question was what role do investors play with these companies that have these kind of freemium models in helping steer them toward uh, the financial growth and how do you help them balance uh, you know their, their mission objectives with money, and and I remember, you know, the first time that we met was at the hacking education meeting that uh, that you'd organized a couple of years ago, and you were taking some heat uh, from some other folks in the room in a good-natured way about money you'd put in Twitter, which didn't seem to have a business model also uh, at the time. And I, I think the questions are related. You know, so, so what are the roles of investors here in steering these people that are, are offering products for free into into something that's a, a quote-unquote real business model eventually? Well, so I, I think that investors can play an important role in these um, uh, freemium type uh, business models because in order to make that kind of business model work, you need to have a lot of scale. You need to have a lot of free users because uh, only a very small percentage of your free users are going to convert to paid users. Even a business like Dropbox, for example, the conversion rate to premium users is a lot smaller than people might think. And so it takes time and money uh, in terms of uh, funding the, the negative cash flow. The burn rate is a term that we use in the uh, startup world. It, it takes capital to be able to fund these businesses through uh, three or four or five years of negative cash flow for them to reach the scale at which the conversion rates to freemium will generate enough revenue to cover all the operating costs in the business. And uh, that's, what's hap that's what happened with Twitter, that's what happened with Facebook, that's what happened with Google, um, and, and lots of other companies as well. So, uh, you know, I, and I actually think it's a pretty important role for the venture capital industry to play which is to support these kinds of business models um, so that they can survive and grow into meaningful companies over time. I think uh, everybody would agree that things like Dropbox and, and Google uh, and, and other services are you know, absolutely great uh, products and services to have and that um, they can and will, and in the case of Google, are you know, highly profitable businesses, but they, they aren't right away. And, and so I think the same thing is true in, in the education business. Uh, it will take time for a service like Codecademy or Duolingo or Edmodo or Coursera or Udacity or, or in, any, any of these services to uh, grow large enough in terms of users and also uh, grow large enough in terms of the organizational structure um, to actually get to the point where they can uh, layer in a, a business model that works well with their uh, free services and, uh, and get to a profitable company. And, and, you know, there's lots of, I think, analogies that we can look at. Um, if you look at something like Coursera, that reminds me a lot of WordPress. And that um, WordPress is obviously available for free, uh, to be used um, as an open source product, and then many people do, you know, download a WordPress instance and, and run it on a server and, and don't pay WordPress anything. But WordPress has a hosted version of the product that um, that is advertising supported, and um, they have a uh, a VIP uh, tier uh, of their hosted product, which is paid for by big companies that need a um, uh, you know, an SLA and, and a lot of hand-holding. And so WordPress is a profitable company, I believe. I don't, I don't know for sure. We're not investors in WordPress. But um, many, many people use WordPress for free, and, and the original go-to-market strategy was entirely a free model. And so when I look at something like Coursera and other kinds of products and services like Coursera, you know, I think to myself, well, you know, it's going to be some variation of the WordPress business model, and it'll just take some capital from 
folks in the venture capital business to ensure that that company can can get to uh, you know the scale that it needs to be able to make that model work. And uh, so that, that's how I think about it. And you know, I think what we can do in addition to providing capital in the venture capital industry is is to provide uh, the lessons that we've learned with these other companies and uh, encourage um, the investor community and the management team to stay the course with confidence that um, that they can make a business using this model and uh, and you know some of the pattern recognition that we have now is the time to start thinking about making money now's the time to start turning on the uh, premium features so on and so forth so, so it's interesting to hear you talk about layering in the business model. Um, you know, there was an article, I think it was in the Chronicle over the summer about Coursera uh, and the contract that they had with the University of Michigan. And somewhere in the contract there was language that said, eventually we will have a business model. And it might look like one of these seven things. We don't know what it will look like yet. But when we do get around to generating revenue, we'll come back and talk with you about that model and figure out a, re a rev share at that point. Um, so is it is it really is that really true? I guess it's kind of hard to believe a, a little bit on the face of it that you would start just with a, a great idea that you think can get to scale, uh, with faith that you're going to get to scale, and then the idea that you're going to figure out the business model kind of as as you get there. Is that 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 kind of sounds like what you're just saying with the idea of layering in the business model? Is that what you meant, or am I am I mis misunderstanding? No, I, it's more or less what I meant. You know, when we invested in Twitter, we had uh, a conversation with the, the founders that was very similar to um, the conversation that Coursera had with the University of Michigan, which is um, we think that we could build a profitable business executing any one of these various approaches to making money. Um, and we said, you know, to the management team, do you have uh, – a preference for any of these and we had a conversation about it and there were certainly some that they liked better than others and um, over the court but we all had confidence that any one of them could produce enough revenue to support the business and create a sustainable uh, operation which is ultimately what you want to have uh, in business and then um, over maybe the two or three uh, initial years of our investment you know, we started chipping away at that list in terms of the things that look less interesting over time and the things that look more interesting over time. Um, and, you know, with Twitter, uh, it was a little bit harder, uh, I think, because there weren't a lot of obvious comparables. Um, with Coursera, you know, to me, you know, that looks a lot like an open source software company. Um, and, you know, I, I love to tell the story. We have a portfolio company um, uh, called uh, Tengen, which makes a, uh, a NoSQL database called MongoDB. And I remember talking to a guy who now is the VP engineering at one of our portfolio companies who at the time I uh, was working at AOL when I first met him and he had uh, been involved with um, rebuilding and relaunching MapQuest which is a pretty well-known mapping service that AOL bought a number of years ago and um, he was working at AOL and, and they tasked him with uh, essentially updating Map, MapQuest to a more modern technical architecture and they decided to implement this with MongoDB on the back end and you know I may, I may be getting this story a little bit wrong, um, but it goes something like this, which is that they uh, deployed the new MapQuest and, and, and there was something like tens of MongoDB uh, instances, you know, on the back end when they publicly launched it and somebody, you know, high up at uh, AOL became aware of this and, uh, and this was after the service had launched and said, gee, you know, we need to call this company and we need to get, you know, a commercial relationship with this company because, you know, we can't have a, we can't have the entire MapQuest service live on the internet without, you know, a commercial relationship with the people who provide um, the back end. And so, obviously, Tengen was happy to provide um, support 
and related services around that. That's that's their business model. They don't sell the software, but they sell a bunch of services around the software, and uh, and so uh, AOL became a customer. And and I don't really know why that wouldn't be um, the way that Coursera would go to market uh, with these big universities. You know, I don't know why universities don't you know essentially take down Coursera and deploy a bunch of uh, classes on it and see if it gets traction and at some point uh, they may realize that this is going to become a real business for them and that you know Michigan is going to have Michigan U online and they're going to charge something for a diploma and they're going to have a whole whole business around this I'm, I'm making this up now and um, and that because of that they need to have a commercial relationship with with Coursera and they they go and enter into one um, and it's a pretty typical open source model uh, not unlike you know what WordPress does with its VIP program um, they could also have a hosted uh, service hosted Coursera versus open source Coursera I mean there's you know I don't know why that isn't you know what 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 that's going to be and and you know in my opinion it's pretty likely that that's what that's going to be although you know of course I could be wrong we're not investors in Coursera and I don't know what they're thinking but that certainly feels a lot like um, a bunch of other things that you know we've seen in the technology industry over the past decade so I don't know why there's a whole lot I, I don't I don't feel like there's a whole lot of mystery around that in my mind anyway interesting I, I mean some of the conversation in in our community has uh, kind of speculating at where the Coursera business model will go has been around uh, selling access to user data uh, whether that's to um, to employers or to advertisers or whoever, but using using user data uh, as a source of revenue, and we're familiar with that, you know, in terms of Google and and Facebook and and people that take our browser history or uh, the videos that we've watched or whatever, and turn that information kind of into ad revenue. But it seems like there's a sensitivity um, around somehow my learning data is more personal and. The, the quizzes that I got right and wrong and the things that I did do or didn't do or didn't spend as much time on maybe as I should have uh, somehow feels more personal um, to people than just their browser history or, or you know the videos that they watched. Um, so, so I'm involved with a number of universities. Um, I'm on the board of one and I'm on you know a board of overseers or a board of advisors for another handful uh, and so um, I get asked this question a fair bit and you know what I have advised the presidents and and management teams, administrations, I guess is the term that we use in the higher ed world, um, is that they should um, work with and support multiple providers of online learning environments, um, and that they shouldn't standardize on any one provider, because I think that uh, we'll see a number of business models emerge. Um, there'll be some open source business models. There'll be, you know, things that look like um, MongoDB or uh, or WordPress.org. There'll be things that look uh, like Twitter and Facebook, um, and there might even be things that look like, um, you know, a full blown sort of software as a service uh, sort of enterprise license model, and uh, and I think we'll see. You know, a hyper-competitive uh, market emerge in these tools. Uh, I, I saw a tweet come across my phone this morning. Uh, somebody had apparently written a blog post uh, in the past 24 hours, I assume, saying that you know we are now in a bubble for you know education technology companies. I don't know if that's true, but. Uh, I certainly believe that uh, lots of people, lots of entrepreneurs and lots of investors think that there's a lot of money to be made in the intersection of education and technology. So I think we'll see a lot of startups and we'll see a lot of startups get funded. We've already seen all that. And I think that this is going to turn out to be a hyper-competitive market. And so my advice to the university presidents and their administrations is that they should support multiple tools and let their professors and faculty members use any number of supported platforms and and have a uh, sort of an open mind about this stuff try to get to you know some common standards around look and feel so that when somebody lands on a University of Michigan 
course uh, on Coursera. It looks the same as a University of Michigan course on uh, an open source platform or, or some other kind of service. And that, you know, let the market settle itself out. And business model will be one of the, uh, you know, one of the uh, things that will um, come to play in terms of how this market settles itself out. Some people will be comfortable with an advertising supported business model where, um, you know, user data is used to target uh, certain things in terms of maybe job placement or in terms of um, other educational pro targeting other educational products and services and 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 some people won't uh, they'll they'll have a different need because of the own their own business model they're trying to execute and so um, I think we're you know relatively early in the development of this market and I, I think it's great that people are thinking about you know business models and, and maybe getting concerned about uh, business models but I think that's also opportunity for entrepreneurs to come in and compete on that basis, and I, and I expect and hope that that's what's going to happen. Yeah, so it's interesting to hear you talk about it that way because I think universities uh, are typically thought of as places where very little innovation happens or where it happens very slowly inside the institution, I'm not talking about the research that gets done and gets spun off into, right, right. into companies. But you know, listening to you talk about it this way and thinking it about every university I've ever had a relationship with, there has been one supported platform for learning technology on campus, and there's really not a mechanism for faculty to vote with their feet or for students to vote with their feet. And inside the university, there's not an opportunity for innovations to compete with each other and emerge as a winner because the university just picks a single platform and they double down on it and they spend 10 years on it because it's so hard to migrate. On yes. the I'm sorry to interrupt. My advice to, as I said, these university presidents that that have been asking me and the and 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 their faculty and administration, my advice is to do the exact opposite. Um, the exclusivity, in my mind, is a bad thing. Don't think that it benefits the university at all. It certainly doesn't benefit the faculty. What they want to do is they want to facilitate competitive market for products and services and let the faculty members choose the best tool for the specific kind of learning environment they want to create and and just focus on some very common uh, standards around look and feel so that when students go look for something when they find a University of Michigan class they know it's a University of Michigan class versus an MIT class versus you know, a, a class being taught by me, right? So, um, and, and, and that's been my advice for exactly that reason. Uh, it doesn't, I think, help anybody. And in fact, it's just like tenure. You know, I, I think tenure in many ways is a bad thing in the education world because it, it, it makes people feel comfortable and they don't have to, you know, work as hard anymore because they can't get removed. And I think the same thing is true with a software vendor. When you enter an exclusive relationship and, and do a deep integration with your university system, it's it, it the, you know that vendor gets fat and happy and doesn't doesn't innovate for you. And so if you know that there's a system, new system coming up that a lot of faculty members are moving to, you know, that's a good thing. And and I don't and I don't think that um, uh, there's any real benefit that anyone would get by standardizing on, on one platform. I mean, you think about blogs, one person's using WordPress and one person's using TypePad and one person's using Blogger and one person's using Tumblr and one person's using Squarespace and yet from the reader's perspective, they all work just fine. Yeah, so, so it seems like there's a corollary then if that's your advice to university presidents. Right? Because the reason that universities double down on a single system is because the office of IT on on campus only has so many people and can only support uh, you know so many services being offered so it seems like the corollary advice then to your advice to presidents is advice to people doing startups that says you know provide something like a SaaS or provide something in the cloud provide something that faculty and students can adopt and use without needing major support by the office of IT on campus because if you really want to create an environment where there are five six ten twelve tools being used Obviously, IT isn't going to install and support all of those. That's going to have to be provided in a new way, different from the way that uh, university people are, are used to consuming services. Is, is that fair? 
Absolutely. 100% agree with that. And I think that's actually the new wave of enterprise software. Um, you look at things like Dropbox and you know Google Mail and Google Drive and and uh, Yammer and you know there's a whole host Skype and Google Hangouts and and a whole host of services. Users are bringing these into the enterprise without the permission of any any IT person whatsoever because um, they can figure out how to use them on their own. They're free. So, so nobody has to, you know, pay for anything. The IT people aren't required to support it, and 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 these things penetrate the organization because they're just good, and more and more people want to use them. And um, so that's what's happened with Edmodo. Uh, not, I'm not here to promote our portfolio companies. I'm happy to talk about any company you want to talk about, but you know, Edmodo is a uh, is essentially a learning. Uh, uh, system, it's a learning distribution system that's used in K through 12, um, and teachers adopt it, and they um, decide that they're going to run a class on Edmodo. And then, when the students show up the first day of class, they write up on the whiteboard or the smart board a code, and then the students just log in Edmodo, type in that code, and effectively, it's like a Facebook friending situation. Those students are now paired with that teacher, and students can pair with multiple teachers, and teachers can pair with multiple students. I mean, it's it's very similar to Facebook in its look and feel, and and so on and so forth. Um, and Edmodo is free, and because it's just like Facebook, teachers have figured out how to use it, and students have figured out how to use it. And the numbers are, you know, extraordinary. I think that there's over a million teachers actively using the platform, and tens of millions of students actively using the platform. And it's just gotten pulled into the K through 12 world because. It's easy to adopt for the teachers, it's easy to use for the students, and it's free and doesn't have to be supported by IT organizations. But just like the uh, TenGen story I told about MapQuest, um, Edmodo gets emails and phone calls all the time from school district superintendents and principals and folks in, in the various IT organizations that exist saying, we want to standardize on Edmodo. We want you know, an exclusive relationship with you. We want to pay you. And Edmodo is really torn about that because uh, it's exactly the thing that, you know, they, they kind of resisted when they created the company and they don't really want to get sucked into the Borg of being, you know, an enterprise software company. I do think that they will ultimately come up with you know, what I think is a pretty elegant business model, not unlike what WordPress has created or what I think Coursera will create and, and what other Dropbox has created, where they will come up with a way for school districts that truly do want to standardize on it to do it in a way that, you know, works well for all parties. But, um, you know, it's just a new mindset that, that I think entrepreneurs need to have, which is um, make it simple, make it easy, don't make IT get involved in the decision-making process, and this thing can get adopted more virally. So that's related to uh, to a question that a student posted in the forum, and another that just came through in Twitter. Um, and let me just read you the question as it came through in the forum. One of the biggest issues I've run into uh, in ed tech companies I've founded is a bias from institutional investors against products that target districts as opposed to students. It seems to me like VCs would rather back a company with a freemium product and 5,000 teachers in disparate schools as opposed to a company with a product that's won one district but has 40,000 students uh, in the product. Is, is that, uh, does that sound accurate to you or is that uh, kind of an off experience that this student's having? And, or no, no, this, I, uh, I think that's exactly right. right. And I think it's related to the conversation we're having before. The thing that scares me as an investor is the sales cycle it takes to close a district. I mean, it's great that you get 40,000 students on the platform when you close one district, but what if it takes you a year-long sales cycle to close a district? And what if it takes, what if one salesperson can only close two or three districts a year? Um, you know, then you're going to need to have a sales organization of 10 or 20 salespeople to get a meaningful number of districts on your platform. And it's very, very difficult to, you know, you, you look at the, the greatest cost uh, in building an enterprise software company is not building the product. It's not supporting the product. It's building and supporting a sales force, a highly paid sales force that goes out and works on these very long sales cycles um, with, uh, you know, uh, 
lots of um, uh, uh, risk around closing these situations and and you know lengthy negotiations around the contract and lawyers get involved and it's it's a very painful business model. It's one that we more or less don't participate in and haven't participated in for a decade. Uh, when I talk about the lessons we learned, you know, over the years um, before we started Union Square Ventures, that's one of the lessons we learned, which is we don't want to invest in companies that have a top-down selling approach. We want to invest in companies that have a bottoms-up selling approach. Yeah, and it, it's even worse for companies that want to get into the, the textbook or the curriculum or content business, right? Because that's a, a seven-year adoption cycle, say, for example. A school's only going to buy science textbooks and science curriculum maybe once every seven years. And how do you, how do you wait that out? Um, it, it is interesting, you know, to think about it's these like models. Like, 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 I have yeah. this friend uh, who's from Kentucky, and um, he's, a, um, he's an aficionado of great Kentucky bourbons. And um, he particularly likes this uh, Kentucky bourbon called Pappy something or other. I forget the, the full name of it. And so Pappy is, um, is so amazing. I've, I've had it a few times. Um, uh, it is very good uh, because it's aged in, um, in a cask, a wood cask, for like 25 years before um, it's put in the bottle. Now, the original uh, company that made Pappy went bankrupt because they couldn't sell the whiskey for 25 years, right? Now, somebody bought it out of bankruptcy and bought all the, the casks and you eventually put it on the market, and now it's a very successful or somewhat successful business. But that's like the textbook thing. I mean, like if it takes seven years to, to get a sale, you just won't be in business. <laughs> yeah. It, I mean, it, it is kind of a funny balance because earlier you talked about one of the roles that capital being to be patient and to provide this runway that is necessary for a company to get up and off the ground and, and get to scale but um, but now what you're saying is you know that your preference of course would be something that was a direct to consumer as opposed to selling through a district or selling through a school or selling through a state office in one of the conversations we had a few weeks ago we had somebody that showed a list of the 20 people involved in a state district school whatever sale that are all empowered to say no but none of whom are empowered to say yes, you know, on, on one of these deals, wh whether it's for technology or for curriculum or, or whatever. And it, it really is painful. Right. So let me just uh, uh, talk a little bit about the patience thing. Um, and one of the things that you want in a venture investor is patience. And one of the things, as I was saying before, before that we can provide is patient capital. But patience needs to be. Um, encouraged by demonstrable progress. And so, you know, Edmodo, I mean, I'd, I'd love to show the adoption chart of Edmodo, and you can see it on a service like Alexa.com. Um, unfortunately, Alexa only goes back two years, but um, if you look at the uh, adoption curve for Edmodo over the past three years, it looks exactly like what you would expect. It goes like this, and then it goes like this, and then it goes like this, right? And each of those jumps is September. It's back to school. A whole new cohort of teachers decides to adopt it. Um, and, you know, so Edmodo is still a free product, and they're just starting to roll out their first business model. And, and, not, and this is not an advertisement for Edmodo. I'm going to shut up about Edmodo in a second. But every September, the investors get additional validation that we're onto something here. And this September was amazing. I mean, you look at the chart, it's just like the amount of new adoption that happened this September is like 5x the amount of adoption that happened last September, which was like 5x the amount of adoption that happened the September before. So that gives us the courage to keep writing the checks. Um, and, uh, and so that's why, you know, uh, patience is important, but you can't wait seven years to get a sale. It just never ever going to happen. No one has that much patience. Yeah, well, and it's great because one of the comments that came through on Twitter was a lot of this conversation is about professors, what professors and what institutions want, but what about learners? You know, where's the focus on learners? And I think what you're saying uh, really fits very well with this. If you really want to focus on learners, then as a business plan, something that goes direct to learner and skips over the district and skips over the school and skips over all the people who can say no but can't say yes, 
uh, really is focused on serving learners and not so much worried about some of these broader, uh, more administrative issues. Well, if you serve the learners, so, the amazing thing is if you serve the learners, the educational institutions will eventually come around and adopt you. Um, but if you, ha if you go to market by selling the educational institutions, the learners may never adopt you. Um, and so I'd much rather go bottoms up than top down. The, um, I was going to say something else about this. Um, oh, right. So we met at our hacking education uh, event. Now it's probably three plus years ago now. And coming out of that, my partner Albert created a bunch of sort of manifestos for investing in education. And we took another year after doing that hacking education before we made our first education investment because we knew that we were walking into um, you know quicksand, so to speak. Uh, education has been a very difficult place to make money. Uh, for a long time, and you know, we were uh, one part extremely excited about investing in it, and one part extremely concerned about investing in it. But one of the manifestos was we should uh, compete with the existing educational uh, uh, system as opposed to sell to it. Um, and that doesn't mean that I think that Codecademy is going to put Harvard out of business or Duolingo is going to put um, University of Pennsylvania out of business. But the way that I think we can impact the market, that, that the entrepreneurs that we back can impact the market most effectively is by going straight to the learners and proving that the tool they built has great outcomes for learners and that learners will increasingly adopt it and then at some point the educational institution will adopt it because they will see that it works and um, so uh, that has been largely our uh, our preferred kind of investment to make in education um, where our customer is the learner and that uh, we need to prove that we can give them valuable, sustainable value, and that then once we do that, um, other good things will happen. And so I completely and totally agree with you. So you, you mentioned outcomes, uh, you know, that, that tools that actually really help learners learn will be adopted by more and more learners and eventually will work their way up into the institutions. Are, are you familiar with, I mean, are any of the startups in your portfolio or other startups that you've, you've heard about as you talk to people? Are there companies that instead of just focusing on making a product that looks really nice and, and gets lots of adoption, are there people that actually focus on outcomes that come back to the people that have bought their tool or are using their tool and say, hey, look, your students are learning this much more that, that are providing uh, maybe research, we might call it, uh, underneath that? And is that something that you would be interested in? Well, we are very interested in the outcomes. Um, one of the things that we know, and you know, I think this is, uh, a, both a negative and a positive is in in these online only tools like uh, Udacity and Codecademy and Duolingo. Uh, the funnel, unfortunately, is is pretty broad and you know gets kind of narrow. The number of people that you know start on Codecademy versus the number of people who get through you know, all of the, the lessons and all of the courses and come out the end and get a job writing software for one of our portfolio companies is very, very small. So the outcomes, um, if you measure it that way, uh, you know, as a percentage of the number of people coming into the system are not great. Uh, uh, on the other hand, you know, the people who do make it through get tremendous amount of value. Um, and so it's balancing that and trying to figure out um, how to iterate on the product so that you can get more and more people getting a positive outcome uh, and uh, also uh, recognizing that not everybody, you know, for something that's free, that, that has a very low uh, cost to provide to society, um, you, you, you have to accept that there will be, you know, a fair bit of churn out of the system. And, but if you are making a meaningful dent, if you are producing tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of newly minted, competent software engineers, 
for free, um, then that may be a good enough thing, even though the churn rate could be 80 or 90 percent, you know, over where they come in the funnel. And, and don't take any of these percentages as fact. Like I'm sure the Code Academy people are flipping out, you know, <laughs> right now because I'm not using the right numbers. But but you know, I think that that's that's just the case with these systems. And I actually really like what Code Academy did with their after school programming clubs uh, thing. So they went to teachers and students who are in schools where they don't offer any computer science classes and they said um, create an after school programming club and we will provide you know turnkey curriculum and lessons and projects that for you to do over the course of you know uh, the school year um, and we'll do that for free. Um, and what they and what they get out of that is they connect into a real world environment that can meaningfully impact that funnel. Um, and I think we all know, everybody in the education business, that 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 the that the real world environment of having a, a teacher who you have to at some point be accountable to and you know a class schedule that you have to go to and work product that you have to hand in does drive completion rates you know at a at a you know, a, in an orders of magnitude higher than an entirely online thing. And the people who, who really, the only people who really succeed in an online only type of situation are these highly motivated self starter uh, type people who can, who can grind it out. So, um, you know, these, you know, when you talk about outcomes, I mean, uh, yeah, we care a lot about outcomes. And, and, you know, we don't want to uh, be invested in companies that, that can't, Create good outcomes because if you can't create good outcomes, then what are you doing? <laughs> so, so let me ask one question that maybe feels a little critical of, of USV. Um, one of the comments that came through had to do with a research paper that you guys released on online education uh, a couple of weeks back or, or early in October. Um, and, and the comment that was made was that th this research paper on online education really seemed to be a collection of quotes from blogs and from TED Talks as opposed to analysis of data by actual education researchers. Um, I, I don't know how you want to respond to that or how you want to th maybe talk about the role of education in the decisions that you guys make or, or was that just framed, was it not framed the right way? How, how would you respond no, to that? I, I think the criticism is valid and extremely helpful and uh, I want to thank everybody who uh, you know, has been critical of us because we, you know, it's a classic example of, you know, I have, a, I have a friend, Danny Meyer, who owns a restaurant, and and he says, you know, uh, his best customers are the people that they somehow messed up with, and then they made it right, and those people are now his best customers, and, you know, that's the thing I've learned a lot over the years, is the people who are the most negative about blog posts I write and um, and things that I say publicly... Um, oftentimes are the most valuable relationships that I could ever obtain because they care so intensely about uh, the subject matter that, that I'm mentioning that they, that they take the time to leave a critical um, comment or reach out with a critical email. And in this specific instance, Christina, who, who posted that online research, um, reached out to a number of these academics uh, and is now engaged in a meaningful dialogue with them uh, and we have uh, been studying a lot of this research and learning from it all for free. You know, it's like amazing. It's like, you know, we could have hired McKinsey and we wouldn't get it as smart as quickly as, as we've gotten. Um, and, you know, I want to acknowledge these people uh, and we're thinking about doing it publicly, uh, taking a lot of this critical feedback and putting it up online and you know, and, and, and sharing uh, this um, with the world, um, you know, not because, you know, we, you know, we're trying to defend ourselves or anything. Look, you know, we're, we're new to this world. We haven't been studying it for a decade or two decades, and we're trying to be smart and thoughtful about it. And, and we're not as experienced or as knowledgeable as a lot of people. But, you know, when we put up our research, you know, was like that was part of the deal. It's like, you know, this is what, you know, we've been reading and we've been studying, and this is where we're getting our ideas from. And, and now we're richer and better off for it. So um, I don't. I'm not defensive in the least, and we don't claim to be experts. And I don't think that in our blog post we did claim to be experts. I think we just said this is what 
we've found out, and this is what we're currently thinking. Yeah, and, and that, of course, that's one of the benefits of being open and transparent, right? Give people a chance to see what you think, help them, let them help you identify kind of areas where you could be stronger, and, and some people will jump in and actually do the concrete work of, of helping with that. But let me pivot to your blog since, you know, since we bring that up. You spend a lot of time blogging. Um, and I mean, some of my favorite things in the last couple of years have been some of the, uh, is it Giant Robot Dinosaur, I think is the name yeah, of the, uh, yeah, yeah um, oh my gosh, the Minimum Viable Personality, uh, some of those posts are just, uh, just terrific. Talk about, you know, how much time do you spend blogging and what, with all the other stuff that's going on in your life, which must, must be a hundred hour work week uh, in the world of, of venture capital, wh why is it that you take time to blog and what are the benefits that you get out of that? What, are you mentoring people remotely without ever meeting them? Are, are you trying to grow the space? What, what, what are you trying to do? Well, that's all of that. Um, you know, it's a, um, it's a grand experiment, I have to say. You know, I, I didn't start it with any preconceived notions of what it could be. Uh, it's become something well beyond what I ever thought it would be. It's become a little bit of a monster uh, in terms of what it takes to, to feed the beast every day. Um, and there are days when I just don't have it, you know, and I wake up in the morning and I try to post before 7 in the morning because then, you know, I wake up the family, walk the dog. At least today I walk the dog. Normally my, my wife walks the dog in the morning, but today I did. Um, make sure my son gets off to school and then, you know, go to work and, and uh, all that. So if I don't get it done before 7 in the morning, I don't get it done. Um, and the reason I do it is that it pays back uh, – you know, well in excess of the amount that I give. You know, my wife Joanne, who goes by the name of Gotham Gal, has a great line, um, which um, I found to be entirely true, which is, "You get what you give," and um, and and what I've actually found is that you get back a lot more than you give, and the more you give, the more you get back, and that's just the way the world works. And so I give as much as I can. And I get back a lot more. And Fake Grimlock is a great example of that. I never met. I mean, I actually have met Fake Grimlock uh, recently. I met him. Um, uh, but like the whole minimum viable personality thing. I mean, it's just it's just awesome. I actually have uh, uh, maybe show this. Um, I've got uh, some Fake Grimlock artwork uh, on my uh, on my. Uh, 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 I don't know. If, I don't know if that worked, um, but anyway, uh, I was holding up my computer, pointing it across the wall. But anyway, um, but you know, it's 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 just literally hundreds, if not thousands, of people like that um, who um, share their their ideas and insights with me, uh, and I just get smarter. And um, it's you know the whole concept of lifelong learning and. You know, what do you do to continue to push yourself to learn and think differently? Um, and for me, it's just an incredible tool for that, and that's why I do it. Let me, uh, let me throw it over to Richard. Uh, Richard, if you, you've got to have a question or two that you want to ask. If you get your mic unmuted there, what, what, what have you got? Yeah, thanks. Uh, super, super interesting. And I, I was actually just looking over at the uh, uh, minimal viable personality here for a second. Um, I uh, One of the things that I'd be interested in hearing, actually sort of a, a two-part question. One is, um, what do you expect people to come to you with, right? You are, you know, representing other, other folks that may be investing in ed startups, like the ones that folks in this class are taking. What do you want to see from them when they come and approach you and say, hey, here's this thing that I, I would like you to consider funding. You know, what, what do you want there? Well, I, I want a product uh, that I can use because uh, well, what, what works for me, and, and this is you know, not true of all investors, thankfully, but what works for me is to be able to see the product that the entrepreneur and their team have built because the way I think about it is, uh, for any given idea, there's going to be a handful, if not more, entrepreneurs chasing more or less that same idea. And what you want to do is you want to back the entrepreneur who is best suited to deliver that idea to market. Um, so, you know, for example, uh, 
you know, the Dropbox team was best suited to deliver the idea of cloud storage, and the YouTube team was best suited to deliver the idea of, you know, streaming video, uh, so a social streaming video service. The, no, neither of those were new ideas, and neither of those were unique ideas. There were literally hundreds of entrepreneurs who chased those very same ideas long before the, those entrepreneurs were successful with them. But those entrepreneurs delivered those ideas to the market, packaged up in a product better than anybody else did, and that's why they succeeded. So for us, what we want to see is sort of the triangle of person slash team, idea, and product. And the product is how they packaged up the idea, productized it, and delivered it to the market. And so that tells me a lot more than just who they are or what their idea is. And so that's what I want to see before we invest. And that means that we won't invest as early as other people do. And that just, uh, that's just part of the deal. Yeah, uh, very helpful to think about it that way. And I, I wonder, are there other, um, if you were just to give it advice you know, to a whole bunch of people that are, are here listening right now, uh, what are areas that you think are, are really ripe for uh, investors to, excuse me, for ed startup kind of folks to look at? You know, where's the low-hanging fruit here? If you were going to say you know, wh where you'd be keeping your eye on watching for new products and tools, what would they be? Did you say ed startup like you want me to talk about within the context of education? Correct. Or learning, I mean, but, but related to the folks that are, are listening to this stream here. Uh, so... You know, some of the, the areas that we're most interested in uh, right now are uh, credentialing and accreditation and, and um, try, you know, there's so much going on now in terms of uh, uh, trying to put more knowledge and more learning tools uh, out there online and, and making it, you know, really accessible for learners. But, you know, eventually we need as a society to know whether somebody actually has learned the material, can they demonstrate that they've learned the material, and then what kind of accreditation and certification might they get so that they can show up to a potential employer or some other uh, person who needs validation. Um, and so that's an area that we think is, is yet to be you know, really solved. Um, another area is peer-to-peer. Uh, and there's, there's a bunch of people doing this already. I mean, at, at some level, Wikipedia is this. Um, uh, but, you know, trying to, uh, you know, leverage web scale uh, community to uh, create learning content and learning tools um, that people can leverage uh, to reduce the cost of creating the curriculum and creating the learning content. Um, I mean, it's great, you know, what Khan Academy has done, uh, and there's obviously a tremendous amount of value in that, um, but uh, it's just mostly the work of one person, and it, you know, it, it occurs to us that, um, you know, literally millions of people could be uh, producing this kind of uh, content. You know, we're, we have a portfolio company called Skillshare, and uh, they do real-world in-person classes, but their tagline, which really, you know, to me is 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 a great vision, is that um, every room can be a classroom, and and every person can be a teacher of something. Uh, everybody is a domain expert in something, and and ev and if you get that person in front of a small or medium or large group of people sitting in a room great things can happen. And I, and I think the same thing is true with, you know, educational content that, uh, you know, trying to make this stuff, um, make it possible for lots of people to produce this kind of content. And there's some, there's some great stuff out there um, in terms of like, uh, uh, you know, that, that take this sort of crowdsourced peer produced model, um, you know, in the, uh, you know, the flashcards, note cards space, um, you know, there's a there's a few companies that are doing really interesting things, sort of creating you know crowdsourced uh, uh, environments where people can share uh, those kinds of things. Um, so that's an area we like a lot, and um, uh, you know, and then you know, sort of deep vertical stuff, 
Codecademy for software engineering, Duolingo for language learning. Um, you know, there's obviously hundreds of other categories of learning um, that people could go deep on, and you know, we're quite interested in in that, that sort of thing. Well, maybe I'll hop back in. I know we're right uh, right up against the hour. Just a couple minutes left. Fred, any any closing comments, closing advice, stuff you you want to say to a bunch of folks who are all here trying to work through their ideas about a, a startup that they want to do in the education space? Well, you know, I encourage them to go for it. And uh, if you have something that you are deeply passionate about, try to take it to market and 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 uh, see if you can make a go of it. So I, I certainly encourage everybody uh, to do that if they if they really have it in them if they have an idea that they just they can't get out of their head then then go make it uh, the other thing that that you know occurs to me as I'm sitting here is how awesome Google Hangouts is um, you know it's uh, it's a tool that I've been using a little bit to do uh, a class that I'm teaching on Skillshare um, and uh, and I really like the idea that like the three of us can be in a hangout together, and I get the interactivity of uh, of the three of us, but yet this can now be broadcast out to, well, I, I guess sort of an infinite number of people via YouTube. Um, and one of the things that I'm thinking about doing for my final office hours um, is, uh, which I'm doing next Monday night, is I'm going to invite the half a dozen students who've been the most engaged in my uh, uh, with my Skillshare class to join me in a Google Hangouts and you know to, to, to kind of replicate you know the the in class experience that because I think it's very difficult teaching some anything without having some learners kind of in front of you uh, where you can see when they're getting it and you can also see when their eyes are glazing over and I think that's really critical and Google Hangouts to me is the first uh, product that I've seen that could potentially allow you to do that kind of thing at scale. So I'm super excited about trying to use it in in, in some educational uh, things that I'm working on. Awesome. Well, Fred, thank you so much for the time. We know you are super busy, and we're just so grateful for the the time we got with you and the answers that we got. And I want to remind everybody that uh, this week is uh, we're in the product cycle. We just started the product cycle this week. Uh, hopefully by now you've taken it several weeks and you've validated the pain or the problem, you've looked at the risks, you've talked through ideas for the solution, and this week really is around building out that list of features for the first minimum viable product, and we look forward to seeing a lot of that uh, on your blogs and, and, and what you're coming up with. Um, thanks to Fred, thanks Richard, thanks to all of you. It's 10 o'clock, and we're done. All right. Thanks. It's been great. Enjoy it very much. Thanks, Fred. Thanks, Fred. Take care. Take care.